everyone. Thanks for tuning in. This is episode number 109. I want to thank you for taking the time to join me today. I pray that this is a blessing and opens up things perhaps you've never considered or thought of or just reinforces other things that maybe you've come to know. Uh, thank you for stopping in if this is your first time and if you've been with me for a period of time here, I, I welcome you. Thanks for following along. Today we are going to be in Romans chapter 7. I was reading through the book of Romans just the other day, and I came across a place that struck me for the first time, really, in this way. And so that's what I want to pass along today. There's some other things tied to it as I've just been chewing on some of these passages that I feel is important and profound, maybe worth yourself to chew on a bit to see what comes to the surface. Um, and as you do that, uh, if, if, you, if you're if you sh- struck with something that's, you know, pretty powerful or that just you want to share, um, I would ask you to send me an email. I'd love to hear your, your thoughts and how the Lord speaks to you in particular ways. Um, it's the Bible study podcasts at gmail.com. Uh, and so I'd love to hear that. Um, I'll try to put the link uh, in the show notes so uh, that I could hear from you. I'd love to, to get the, that feedback. So uh, Romans chapter 7, I'm going to read verses 1 through 6, and then we're just going to dive in and go through some portions that I want to illustrate today. Uh, Romans chapter 7, verse 1. Do you not know, brothers and sisters, For I am speaking to those who know the law, that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. For example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then... If she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another to him who was raised from the dead, in order that we might bear fruit for God. For when we were in the realm of the flesh, the sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in us, so that we bore fruit for death. But now, by dying to what once bound us, we have been released from the law, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. So, as I was chewing on what I discovered, it really centers around this example that Paul gives in illustrating his point by way of a married woman bound to her husband. And so that is the, I guess, primary objective is to bring that to the surface. But uh, again, there are some subsequent things that I I feel are important to mention. And so we'll just go through uh, verse by verse till, uh, till we get to where we are trying to land this thing. Um, So the first point, and really comes in the first verse itself, uh, Paul, who was writing here to the Romans, he says in verse 1, for I'm speaking to those who know the law. Now, this word in the Greek, know, is the word gnosko. 
And it, it's one thing that I'm wanting to, to highlight here is what exactly is implied in this word, no, K-N-O-W. It's really difficult because in, especially in the Hebrew and the Greek as well, there's so much in intertwined in their words. And when we transliterate it or turn it into the language that we as the reader uh, use, there's a lot of things that are missed and lost in translation. And by no means am I a Greek or Hebrew scholar. I do the best I can to try to discover things. So um, there, I have a great deficiency in this area, but the Greek word there is gnosko. And of the many things that it can mean, I want to point out a subtle difference in in maybe what Paul might be implying. For example, in 1 Corinthians 8, verses 1 through 3, again, this is Paul writing again, and he uses a lot of this word, no. We know that we all possess knowledge, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something do not yet know as they ought to know. But whoever loves God is known by God. Now, when you look at those Greek words, there's a different know that finds its way in the text. And it's the Greek word I'm going to butcher this, but oida, O-I-D-A. And we also see the same gnosko word in this portion as well. So now we see two words that within themselves, we read them as the same word, but in the Greek, they are communicating something rather unique or separate. And he's, when he says, we know that we all possess knowledge, um, I believe that word is that oida. And and then he continues, but knowledge puffs up while love builds up. Those who think they know something, that's the oida as well, do not yet know. Now that know is gnosko. So those who think they know something do not yet gnosko as they ought to gnosko. But whoever loves God is gnosko by God. So if your uh, powers of deduction are starting to uh, send you some signals, what I believe is communicated in the oida, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, is, is more of a, of a head knowledge and gnosko is in in its sense is a is a a complete knowing you might even could say to and give me some liberty here maybe a heart knowing now this as i went back to back in romans chapter 7 1 i couldn't help but remembering in genesis when adam knew eve now, of course, this is going to be a different original word because Old Testament it would be written in Hebrew. And that is the word, um, and I'm sure pronouncing this one incorrectly, um, yada. And this is the word used for when Adam knew Eve and she bore a son. So there is an intimacy in that Hebrew word of yada. And and it is implying a intimate knowing. And I think that is what's captured in perhaps essence in the word gnosko. So just something to think on is when Paul is speaking to brothers and sisters 
speaking to those who know the law. Perhaps he is emphasizing, he is speaking to those who have an intimacy with the law, who are connected not just necessarily in the head, but rather the heart and as one might know his bride. Okay. So who knew there was so much <laughs> in underlying in, in the text? Uh, so I, I submit that idea to you. So he, he, he goes on and says that the law has authority over someone only as long as that person lives. Now, the authority of the law is ended when that person ceases to be. Now, he gives us the example at when the husband dies, the woman is released from that law. So this is telling us that the law, specifically in this example of adultery, the law's authority ends at some point in time. Now, just making a mental note of that. And he's going on, he says, for example, by law, a married woman is bound to her husband as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she is released from the law that binds her to him. So then, if she has sexual relations with another man while her husband is still alive, she is called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she is released from that law and is not an adulteress if she marries another man. Okay, so we're going to land on this point later, but what I want you to maybe even consider pausing this and thinking about it because I want you to think about when when he's giving this example, who in this example dies? Think about who is the woman in the illustration. Also, think who was she married to exactly? Also, notice that in in Paul's um, example or illustration, notice that he uses the phrase and parallel, really, of a woman and sexual relations and marriage. If you'll, if you'll notice, this analogy has within it kind of built-in to intimacy and enjoyment. He is paralleling the idea of intimacy and in inside of covenantal marriage, there is a, could we say, gnosko, maybe, a a a intimate knowing of one another and inside of that partnered relationship both man and woman in covenantal marriage there is an enjoyment that is present inside of that knowing so when we read this in the back burner of our thoughts we should keep in mind not only is there an intimacy between both partners, male and wife, but also that there is an enjoyment of husband and wife. And, and, and then as he explains that sexual relations component, he then ties it up with being married to. So he's reinforcing this isn't just some, you know, loose sexual relationship that that she can now have with with any other man that she desires it's it's tied to marriage it's tied to covenant and that's the i believe one of the 
bigger themes inside of marriage itself is is covenant and it's a it's a promising of oneself to another and that's why marriage is so important because it's through covenant that you get to enjoy the intimacy and just again the enjoyment of what that produces and out of covenantal marriage you then can produce offspring so there is a generational component to to this joining of a man and woman together to to be become one one flesh so these are some questions to just be thinking of as you process this text and again even pause this to think about those questions who is dying in this uh, scenario who is the woman who was she married to so think on those things now uh, another thought that i want to to propose is when paul is explaining this scenario in verse 2 for example by law a married woman is bound to her husband but as long as he is alive. But if her husband dies, she's released from the law that binds her to him. Now, this is a question, another question, and, and probably one even controversial, um, but I, I propose it to get you to think. I want you to be asking yourself these questions and, and navigating your responses through the lens of Scripture. It's always important to, to navigate your responses through the lens of Scripture. It keeps us anchored, and it keeps us stable, and it prevents us from drifting out into error. So the question that I pose to you is, is sin relative? Now, before you just quickly jump to an answer and stick to your ground, you may then ask the follow-up question, what do you mean relative? Is that, is that to say that some, sometimes it's a sin and sometimes it's not a sin? And, you know, boy, we can see how that would get you into some trouble when you start trying to justify your behavior and, and trying to rationalize whether it's sinful or not sinful. So if that makes you nervous, that's that's good. It should make you nervous because um, I don't mean to say that relative in the sense that explicit sin isn't always explicit sin. That's not the case. Idolatry, adultery, lust, greed, all these things that are explicit in Scripture, um, that's explicit sin, and it's and it remains sin. It's not like you could say, well, in this case, idolatry is okay, um, even though God forbid it. That's we're not saying that, and that's not what I'm implying. In is sin relative? Let me uh, let me give you an example of this. Um, what about this? What about sin in terms of non-explicit? This is what I'm actually terming relative. So, for example, let's say you are walking down the road and there is a homeless person um, who is in, let's say it's possibly colder outside, and you walk by, you see them, and you feel the Lord say to you, give them your coat. Now, you, you've you gotten that direction and you decide not to react to that direction and you walk past. Did you sin? I would say absolutely you sinned. Why? Because you disobeyed God's direction to give them your coat. Now, that is not to say that if another individual is walking that same path and sees the person but does not hear the directive to give that individual their coat, 
that does not mean that they sinned because they didn't give the coat. Do you see what I'm saying? So, I suggest to you that sin in some ways can be relative. Um, it's not the fact that the coat was not given that was a sin. It is that the sin is relative to that commandment, to that decree. Now, in the same way, I think that this is linked to what Paul is talking about here is it's not the fact that she, this this woman, marries another man and has intim, is intimate with him. That in itself is not the, the issue. It is relative to the condition of the, we'll call him first man or first husband. Is he present still? Is he alive? If he is, then she has committed a sin. She has become an adulteress. But if he is no longer alive, she is free to then marry again to what we'll call the second man. So in this scenario, that is what I am proposing in terms of in is in, in terms of relative. Um, it's why I suggest that is because I I want you to think perhaps more um, deeply is maybe not the right word, but to think more intentionally about when we hear God speak to us something, when we choose not to respond to it, we are directly disobeying the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit. And, and we should, um, that should cause us to, to be troubled and come to the realization that we, we are in fact disobeying what God is telling us to do and in fact sinning. So, um, of course, explicit sin still exists. We're not, we're not lowering the bar by saying that sin can be relative. What we're in fact doing, and I would argue, is that we are actually raising the bar and causing, causing us to, those who belong to God, to then more greatly consider the weight of when we reject those promptings by the Holy Spirit who is in fact God himself, we are indeed sinning. So that's what I want to leave you with on that particular note. Um, the next thing is where I really felt the lights to come on in this scripture. And I will preface this revelation with the statement of no doubt that scripture uh, teaches this and that there is a there is a self death that occurs the, a death to ourself you know, crucifying our flesh um, that there is that self death that occurs in our faith journey but this is not what i believe paul to be describing here when he talks um, which is verse four, when he says, so my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, I've thought this to mean that I was the one that died. But in Paul's analogy, notice it was the husband, not the wife, that died. When Paul says you died to the law, think of that rather the law's authority over me died. He perfectly illustrates it in his example. The woman is still living but rather it's the law's inability to judge, if you will, the final result. Remember, both, both results are the same. The result is she marries another man and is uh, in, intimate, 
uh, for all you adults out there, you know what that implies. She's intimate with this second man. So the outcome is the same, but it's the law's authority to judge what happened is no longer available. So this is what Paul here is saying by saying the phrase, you died to the law. He's not saying you died yourself, but rather you died, meaning the law's authority against you ended. That you died to the law. Okay. It was the death of Christ's body that died. Now, as we think about as we think about this illustration and and I'll be honest and transparent, I as I began to try to unpack this in my mind, there are st- I am I'm still wrestling with identifying exactly who this first man is. Remember when I asked earlier, I asked the question, who dies? Well, that was pretty clear in the illustration. It was the husband, the first man. But um, when we say who is the woman, well, that would be us. That would be those, um, those who are married to Christ. But who was she married to? Now, this is the question that really wrecked and continues to wreck my thinking, my understanding. Um, I'm going to s- propose who I think that first man could be. Um, I think arguments could be made for um, different scenarios of this first man. And I think scripture could support some of those options, but if I want to take Paul's illustration at as face value as I can, then then I think that we said the woman is us and the first man. So that's when I begin to identify first man, second man, it was then it was then when the idea of first man marriage to adam now keeping keeping everything parallel and as, as congruent as we can we know this first man um in fact is a man and there was a marriage So, what man were we, call us the bride of Christ, what man were we married to? And in this example, the man is actually a a distinct man from the second man. When I began to first think on this, I thought, it was the death of one man that gets us to the second man marriage. My initial thought was, oh, you know, it, it was the death of one to produce life in the second. And so I thought, well, that's Christ himself. And in fact, when we when we read the the portion here that you died through the body of Christ, I thought, okay, well, that's it. But I keep getting hung up on this idea of his illustration because the first man is a distinct man from the second man. And so as I'm thinking on first man, second man, then it occurs to me, we refer to Adam as uh, the first man and we refer to Christ as sometimes they say the second Adam, or sometimes he'll be referred to as the last Adam. Um, so then I begin to think of it through that lens. Romans 5 tells us that death reigned through Adam. 
for death came through Adam and life came through Christ. And so if we, if we look from through that lens, um, Adam is a distinct man from Christ. And through Adam, we also have an understanding of law. And through Christ, we have the revelation of grace. So it, it does tend to hit a lot of boxes or check a lot of boxes to, to be justifiable that this first man that we were married to was Adam. And when you also think of the statement that Jesus gave to Nicodemus about you must be born again, and when you think about that we were born everyone as a res- as a result of this sin of Adam were born into uh, born into sin so we were born of Adam and we must be born again so in that i propose that the first man in this illustration could be or likely would be as far as I can understand it now at the moment would be Adam and the second man by whom we are married to is none other than Jesus Christ. So this is an interesting component here. You see, Paul told us in this scripture that the woman is unable to have intimacy with the other man or the second man as long as the first man is still alive. So this is really, this is neat. Law forbids intimacy with the second man while the first man is alive. When we think of, especially in, in Romans and other areas where Paul writes of this, this old man or the old self and being ourselves dead, crucified with Christ, buried and raised to newness of life, we think of once that once that first man, that, that, that covenant to the first man, to the first Adam, to um, the uh, death by guilt uh, through sin, it takes, it takes a death to then permit intimacy through, we'll call him the last Adam, or Christ Jesus himself. So... I've always perceived this scripture for whatever reason to be describing or detailing the the death that it would take for me to be free from when in fact I believe it 100% to be describing the death of the husband that releases me from the law so that I can become covenantally intimate with this last husband. As Paul concludes this portion, and I think it is reinforcing the very point of it all, and I think this is important for us to maintain in the forefront of our minds, in our understanding, he says in in verse 4, So, my brothers and sisters, you also died to the law through the body of Christ that you might belong to another, to him who was raised from the dead in order that we might bear fruit for God. Now, that, uh, my friends, is the point of belonging to another 
who did what we could not do, and we now belong to him legally so that, why? We can bear fruit for God. Because at the end of all things, at the end, the consummation of all things, we read in Revelation that the Son then takes all that the Father has given him, that the Father has put everything under the Son's feet, Christ Jesus. Christ himself then takes that and gives it to the Father. It is the gospel has always been the beginning of which is God himself. It's not humanity's uh, depravity. It's not humanity's fall. The beginning of the gospel is God himself. And at the end of all things, it is a returning of all things to God himself. God is the beginning and the ending of the gospel so that he may be all in all. So in our lives, in our Christian lives, our at the end of the day, it is about bearing fruit for God, not working for God. Bearing fruit is the result of being connected to the source. You think about trees and how they bear fruits. They can they are connected to the main trunk, the vine. It is a byproduct of being connected. A, a vineyard, grapes do not produce by striving to produce themselves. It is a byproduct of being connected to the vine. But rather than a production mentality, it is a, it is a proximity an intimacy byproduct. So let everything that we do produce fruit for God, not from striving, but out of connectivity. So I think this is where we will end this one. Uh, thank you for taking the time to join me. Pray that it was enlightening and that God would use it, multiply it, and to him be all the glory and honor. We'll see you on the next one. God bless. I would trade a million lifetimes for a moment here with you. And in your house, I'll